Hi guys, welcome to the BRHS Science National Honor Society Tutoring Lecturing Series. Um, today we're going to be going over biochemistry, which is chapters 2 and 3. Um, and before we get started, it's really important to understand, it's really important to understand the three bases uh, to, this chap to these chapters. Uh, the first is elements, uh, second is atoms, and third is compounds. And all of these uh, make up matter. Matter is anything that has volume and take up space. So if we look at um, the diagram on the right, you'll see that the human body is made up of four main elements. And these elements also make up 96% of all living matter. And those are nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. And these elements, uh, when, they, when they combine with other elements, uh, form compounds. And we'll look at those a little bit later. But it's important to understand that while these four elements are crucial to the survival of all species, so are these trace elements. Um, for example, in humans, uh, iodide, uh, sometimes you'll see salt. It's called iodized salt. That's because it's a really crucial uh, element. Although we only need it in small amounts, without it, our body can function normally. So next we're going to look at atoms, and atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, all of which are called subatomic particles, and these atoms make up elements. So an element, um, they're most well known, I guess, on the periodic table, uh, and they're all made of one type of atom. So the element carbon, if I have a carbon compound, for example, of just carbons, although that really wouldn't happen in nature, that element is made up of only carbon atoms. So then if we look at the different types of atomic particles a little bit more closely, we have electrons, uh, which have an E negative symbol because they have a negative charge, and those have a mass of 1 2,000th AMU. So that's a really small, um, a really small uh, mass. And an AMU stands for atomic mass unit. So when we go later on to talk about um, the true mass of an atom, we're really not going to take electrons into account because they're so small. Um, and the location of these electrons are going to be in the electron cloud. So here, if you imagine this is an atom, uh, all of the electrons would be out here. And in the middle would be the nucleus. And the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, and they have a mass of 1 AMU, just like a neutron, which has a neutral charge that also has a mass of 1 AMU. And those are going to really make up the mass of an atom. So as you can see in the periodic table, there are two different numbers that are really associated with uh, each atom. You have atomic number and mass number. So atomic number is the number of protons. And the number of protons also is usually equal to the number of electrons. Um, and then uh, in, if you wanted to derive uh, the number of neutrons, you take the mass number minus the atomic number. So if we're looking at mass number, remember mass number is basically asking us what is the mass of this atom? And what two subatomic particles make up the mass of an atom? It's the protons and it's the neutrons. So this, uh, this will help you if you ever have a question that's asking you to find the number of neutrons in an isotope, for example, which we'll go over next. You take the mass number minus the atomic number. So isotopes are a special type of atom uh, that differ in the number of neutrons. So isotopes are common um, when we're doing uh, so radioactive isotopes are really common um, because those are great if we're doing things with ra uh, carbon dating, for example, which we'll see below. And these isotopes uh, can, help, can help us uh, understand how long an organism uh, was, how many years ago an organism was alive. For example, in fossils, it's common to do uh, radioactive dating, and that often involves isotopes. Um, below we have some common examples of uh, carbon. So carbon-12 is what's shown on the periodic table, and that's the most common isotope of carbon uh, with six protons, six neutrons. 
And then carbon 13 and carbon 14, you'll often see in types of application questions because they're good for uh, radioactive, um, radioactive studies. So now that we've looked up the different parts of atoms, uh, which again make up elements, let's look at chemical bonds, which is really what elements are, are made to do. They, they're made to bond with one another to help make different compounds. So the distribution of electrons in the electron cloud determines an atom's chemical properties. So in the picture below, you'll see um, the drawings of atoms. So in the middle, you would have the nucleus. And then outside, in these things called electron shells or electron orbitals, there are a max number of electrons that we'll use. Um, so in the first shell, Atoms have a maximum number of two electrons. And then in every shell after the first, they have a max of eight electrons. So just to reiterate that point, so the first shell is going to have a maximum of two electrons, and every shell outside of the first is going to have a maximum of eight. And the last shell that's shown when um, electron uh, diagrams are, are uh, atomic diagrams are shown, um, that's going to be called the valence shell. And those valence electrons, meaning the outermost electrons, are going to, turn, are going to determine how different, um, different elements bond with one another. So there are two, well, three main types of bonds, covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. Uh, while there are others, those are really going to be the main three that uh, you guys are going to focus on. So covalent bonding is going to be bonding in which atoms share electrons. So if we look here, methane, um, the chemical formula for that is CH4. The way that um, element's going to bond uh, with so the way the element of carbons gonna bond with the hydrogens is shown here so it's called tetrahedral shape um, that's not really important but what's important to understand is that these hydrogens and the carbons are gonna share electrons so if you look at a periodic table or pull one up you'll notice that carbon has a valence shell with four electrons and because all atoms want to have a full valence shell of eight it's going to bond with these four hydrogens, and hydrogens each have one electron. So if carbon has four and each of the hydrogens has one, one times four is four, and four plus four is eight. And that eight is going to make the carbons and all the hydrogens happy because the hydrogens are going to have the two electrons they want, and the carbon is going to have the eight electrons that it wants in its valence shell. Um, so that's covalent bonding. So under the broader umbrella of covalent bonds, there are two main types, polar covalent and polar non-covalent. So methane is an example of non-covalent of covalent bonding that's non-polar. And this has to do with electronegativity. So electronegativity is the power of an atom to attract electrons towards it. So carbon and the four hydrogens have similar electronegativities, so they share the electrons well. But in water, for example, H2O, which is another example of covalent bonding, uh, we see polar covalent bonding. So polar covalent bonding is going to be shown by this little, sigma, this little symbol here called the sigma. So this is sigma positive and this is sigma negative, meaning that the oxygens have a slightly negative charge and the hydrogens have a slightly positive charge. And that just has to do with the way in which the electrons are shared. So if you see here, there are more electrons around the oxygen, which makes it more negative. So that means that the electronegativity of oxygen is higher than that of the two hydrogens. And this is going to be called a hydrogen bond, uh, which is a special type of bond that you're going to see in between nucleotides and DNA. Um, and you'll see it later on, and it's going to be really important when we go over the uh, properties of water. So the other type of bonding we're going to see uh, is called ionic bonding. And that's going to be between two atoms with opposite charges. So the two different types of ions are anions and cations. Cations have a slightly positive charge, and anions have a slightly negative charge. 
Um, and oftentimes these are going to create uh, salts, um, which you'll see later on in the year. Um, but what's important to do, just as a little review, so here we have the nucleus of a sodium atom. Here we have the first electron shell, which can contain a maximum of two electrons. Our second shell is going to have a maximum of eight electrons, which are totally filled. And then because of sodium's atomic number, which as you'd be able to tell from this, uh, from this diagram, is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, meaning it has 10 pro um, I'm sorry, 11 protons and uh, 11 electrons, therefore, um, the last valence shell is only going to have one electron. And this electron is going to want to bond with a, uh, or be given away to another atom so that sodium can have its full outer shell have eight and almost get rid of this last shell. So a great, um, a great uh, bonding partner, uh, so to speak, with uh, sodium is chlorine because chlorine's valence shell has seven electrons, which means it only needs one more to get to that magic number eight. So NaCl, which is a uh, table salt, um, that's going to be formed by the ionic bonding between a sodium and a chlorine ion, uh, chlorine atom, sorry. So what's going to happen is the sodium atom is going to donate its, its electron to chlorine, and that means that sodium is going to have a full valence shell, and so is chlorine. So that's going to make both of these, um, both of these uh, atoms happy, um, and again, you're going to create that uh, compound, remember a compound when two or more atoms come together called sodium chloride, NaCl. And then at the end, this sodium's going to become a cation, which again has that positive charge because now there are less electrons than protons. And this chlorine ion is going to become an anion because it has an extra electron than what it would usually have. So just taking a uh, step back to look at those hydrogen bonds, so a hydrogen bonding is going to be between um, two molecules with uh, that are going to be um, covalent, but also polar. So as I said before, um, water molecules are going to involve themselves in um, hydrogen bonding because if you see here, the sigma negative charge of the oxygen, meaning it has extra electrons uh, floating towards it in this compound, is going to bond well with the hydrogen of another water molecule. And while these bonds are going to be weak, they're going to be really important uh, when, again, when you look at uh, DNA, for example, uh, in chapters uh, 9 and 10, I believe. So these polar molecules are going to bind with each other uh, through hydrogen bonds, uh, and that's just going to create an atmosphere where uh, cells don't have to put in too much energy to break these bonds. Um, and water is really the classic example. Um, so the last thing we're going to go over in part one of this multi-part biochemistry review is going to be chemical reactions. So they can either break or make chemical bonds. Um, so usually you'll see on the left-hand side of any uh, chemical reaction, you'll have the products. And on the right-hand side, you'll have the reactants. So here you'd have the product, uh, I'm sorry, the pro I'm sorry, the reactants. And on the right-hand side, you'd have the products. So the reactants come together to form a product. So in the example of synthesis, your reactants are going to be A and B, and they're going to synthesize a new compound, AB. So in another type of reaction called a decomposition reaction, we're going to take A and B, which are bonded as our reactants, and they're going to form our products, which are going to be A and B, but not bonded to each other. So here's a good example. 2H2O2 is going to break down into 2H2 plus O2. The, other, the third type uh, is going to be single replacement, where we take a bonded with a third, and then we're going to replace this uh, reactant with this reactant to create a product where now it's AC plus B. And then the last time is going to be double replacement, which is uh, similar with single replacement, except each of these pairs are going to change. So now A is going to be with C instead of B, and C is going to be with um, C is going to be with A instead of uh, D, and the same thing here. B is now going to bond with D as opposed to bonding with A. So these double replacement, single replacement, decomposition, and synthesis reactions 
with our reactants on this side and our products on this side are going to be really crucial as we move into creating uh, different types of compounds. So this concludes this section.